you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back with Cut Colonel Jan Malan here. He's almost an old friend of Legacy now, but the man's got fantastic stories to tell. We long not done with him, I can tell you, he's going to be quite a few episodes. And we're very grateful for that, because, you know, this is how we get the full picture. We have to be able to speak to people who were there. It is that simple. And he was there. And he said to me, he wants to talk about the fact that we actually won the border war. Now, there's a lot of people here who would say to me, Chris, we're in command right now. Who sits there in Tainais? We sit in Pretoria. There's different ways of looking at this, I'm quite sure. And I'm sure that the Colonel will explain his views. Thank you for coming, sir. We are very, very grateful for you, like always. It's over to you. Perhaps you can just start by giving a short background of yourself so that people can know that you do speak with authority. And then we will answer the question. Why did uh, we won the border war and, and the rest as well? Chris, thank you very much. And hello, every, everybody listening. Uh, I'm a retired Colonel Jan Malang of the uh, old South African Defence Force and the South African National Defence Force. We changed, obviously, uh, after our uh, elections in 1994. I hold a B military degree uh, from the uh, Military Academy in Saldana. And I also completed a, an honors degree in strategic studies in UNISA in 1981. I commanded eight company, one South African infantry battalion uh, at the 61 mechanized battalion group in 1982. And uh, for five years after that, I was responsible for the training of the South African Army Combat Team and Combat Group Commanders courses at the Army Battle School in Loatla. Uh, during this uh, period, I was also put in command of four South African Infantry Battalion and was responsible for the successful South African attack on the 21st Brigade of FAPLA on the 13th of January 1988, east of Quitiquanaval. I uh, completed my Senior Commander Staff uh, Duties course in 1989 and then was the officer commanding 8 Sai in Uppington until 1994, when I was posted at the Army College in Victoria as the chief instructor of the senior command and staff duties course. Um, so that is just my, my background. And I had the privilege of receiving, after the war, one of only five South African officers that received the prestigious Pro Virtue Decoration for Outstanding Operational Leadership. Uh, something that is bestowed on one and uh, you don't think you, you really uh, deserve it. My topic for this, this uh, presentation is why we won. Uh, and and, and uh, the opening thought that I want to give you is historically, smaller, less, uh, well-equipped forces have relied on maneuver as a means of overcoming numerical deficiencies and achieving success and victory. And it is really this dynamic element of combat, the means of, of concentrating forces at critical areas to gain and use the advantage of surprise, psychological uh, shock, position and momentum, which enables smaller forces like the South African Defense Force to, to defeat much larger ones. More specifically, it is the employment of forces through movement, supported by fire, to achieve a position of advantage from which to destroy or to threaten destruction of the enemy. So uh, finally, it is the volume of fire that counts. You win if you can kill more of the enemy than he can kill of you. Fire is the key to mobility. To fire is to move. Weapons, when correctly used, will invariably bring decision. But without superior firepower, mass and velocity can never win a war. Now, I'm, I'm starting with these uh, 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 sentences because I, I believe that if you, if you know uh, Armand Rommel, 
saying the art of taking the offensive involves concentrating strength at one point, forcing a breakthrough, rolling up and securing the, securing the flanks on either side, and then penetrating like lightning before the enemy has had time to react deep into his rear. And, and that is those uh, points of departure that, that we used. The South African Defense Force of the late 1980s was a formidable uh, fighting force. It was molded over years of low and high intensity fighting in Southwest Africa, now known as Namibia, and in Angola, within the context of, of uh, uh, a community fighting for survival in the country, they believed then uh, to be left by their forebears. Various wars have, uh, uh, for this right, they have been fought since 19, or, sorry, 1652. This time, the enemy was the communist-inspired foreign forces aiming to destroy their Christian-based homeland. It was war, and every loyal and right-thinking South Africa was ready to spend not only their time and effort, but even put their lives at stake to protect this. Uh, it did not ask for two years of, uh, only for two years of national service, but every time uh, that uh, the troops were called up for the citizen force and the commanders. It was simply the right thing to do. The uh, South African army would, would win most, almost all their battles, their units encountered during the, the Bush War. It was, this is an, an undisputable fact. The question should arise uh, is what, what, what made this possible? that this force uh, could fight numerical far superior forces, far north of their own territory. And uh, the whole idea is to, to, to explain my, my point of view. So, so the first thing that I think was, was in our advantage was an exceptional human material. The, the South African Defense Force could, through the national service system, draw on the very cream of the country's well-structured and managed school system. White boys were brought up well knowing that they were all going to do two years of national service after school. There, you would be made a man, and this would give you a high prestige in the eye of your family, the community, and yourselves. Now, you know heroes are made in war, and in an era of sport boycotts, this was the way that young, that young man would show his character. The South African Defense Force would, of course, also take in volunteers from the colored, black, Bushman, and Indian communities. This was done with great success, as in all previous South African wars. From this full complement, the, the permanent force uh, could, could recruit. No wonder that a formidable force of national service and permanent force officers and non-commissioned officers was created. Contributing factors with a very strict selection criteria, and then the most rigorous training syllabus that you can think of. This brought the cream to the top and separated the best from the good. From the best, the most suitable was chosen and promoted to lead from the front on all levels. So I believe we had exceptional human material to work with. The second interesting fact was discipline. Exceptional discipline was from the outset the name of the game in the old defense force. Everything was done in very strict and professional way and very little room was left to make mistakes. During the first three months of basic training, a lot of time was spent on parade grounds, teaching troops to be on time, listen to commands, to concentrate, to execute with precision, to focus, and to apply exact standards. Everything was done in groups and through group dynamics. The group would bring perpetrators in line. The typical military command, as you probably know, includes five Ws. Who, what, where, when, and what thereafter. This would be executed to the T. It is also interesting to note that there's no why 
in this military command. Commands would not be questioned. On advanced courses, much more emphasis was laid on the end result and why certain tasks had to be done. This was done to ensure that the lower commanders would reach the objective set even when further commands were not forthcoming and a breakdown in communications would occur. A very good example of this was the fact that the old defense force at all parades and other and order groups, everybody was already seven minutes before the start ready uh, and that ensured exact eight, eight hours. Nobody dared to be late. There was, there was no excuses asked for or given to. You just took your punishment and made sure it didn't happen again. This created a huge amount of respect throughout the system. So discipline was at the foundation of, of our ability. The third interesting element was the system. The previous South African system was very powerful. It began with well-tuned school system where everything was handled with great esprit de corps and in competition, from school cadet competitions right through all sporting activities like athletics and rugby, etc. All teachers were sent to the School of Infantry where they underwent training as officers and non-commissioned officers. They then were posted back as teachers, ensuring that the first principles of discipline and teamwork were learned to the the to be troops, then still young uh, uh, school pupils. This prepared the young men for their national service, which would continue for another year of intensive training. It would not matter which mastering you, you, the young recruit took. He would experience a lot of self-actualization in his second year during operational service, whilst participating in actual operations and combat. Everybody started climbing the ladder from the very bottom. All training was very practical and the same for everybody. Live ammunition was used throughout. Thorough competency evaluation was done before anybody was promoted into the few available positions. The Defense Force was of course fortunate to have real war at hand. Um, at hand. Everything was very focused. Training and preparation was very realistic and meticulous. Knowledge gained was transferred as the best operators were used as instructors. There was a clear motivation for every action. So the system in South Africa at the time was very strong. The fourth interesting element was the weaponry. South Africa experienced a total international embargo. And we could not buy any weapons required from abroad. The huge advantage of this, of course, was that the Defense Force was forced to develop and maintain its own equipment suited for the South African bush. This led to the development of, of exceptional mine and bush protected vehicles like the Rattle, the Buffalo, the Roycut, G5, G6, long range artillery, the Foster Oral the Battelier multiple rocket launches, the technical service Wittings, the recovery vehicles, the engineers plof other mine clearing devices, anti-aircraft technology, field medical capabilities, the South African forces, Roy Falk attack helicopter, etc., etc., to name but a few. It made the country a world player amongst a few countries in the world that, that had the capability to produce weapons and be self-sufficient. It also created the opportunities to export. Various leading engineers emerged. And it eventually led to the capability to produce our own atomic weapon. It gave us a lot of self-confidence and obviously made us proud. The next thing that I want to point out why we won was the training of soldiers. The South African Defense Force became masters in bushfighting and development of various standard battle drills and techniques. Integrated fire and movement and fire and maneuver techniques 
became standard with standard commands were perfected. We could execute it successfully in very thick bush and at night. The use of command and control maps, overlay orders, integrated tactics on the same and different axes, night fighting skills, stealth operations, fire belt actions, winning the firefight, close cooperation with indirect and air weapons, etc., was all mastered. Standard operating procedures or SOPs were developed and drilled to the lowest level. Integrated combat elements, combat teams, combat groups were established with elements from all services. We would have armored, mechanized infantry, artillery, mortars, engineers, anti-aircraft, medical, technical, and signal elements trained and deployed in joint warfare operations. That's why the, the whole uh, idea of the Army Battle School at Luatla came from. Two-sided exercises were introduced to train against a thinking and moving opponent. Full-scale exercises using some fire equipment took place at the Army Battle School, where war could actually realistically be simulated. It entailed real fire exercises from sec section to brigade level, re repeating it until everybody knew exactly what was ex ex uh, expected of them and could ex execute with self-confidence as a team uh, member. Combat group and brigade commanders learned long and short planning techniques and how to affect their plans throughout with, through overlay and radio orders. Battle talk was perfect. Standard drills using standard commands were practiced as high as battle group level. Great care was given to rifle and gun shooting. Troops and officers had to qualify during their monthly table one, two, and three shooting exercises with live ammunition. Quick kill and bush lane courses were built to stimulate real battle scenarios. Troops were individually drilled until they could kill the enemy just using a few quick draw shots. The South African troops were very good at this and many earned sharpshooter status. And we were fit. Everybody was forced to complete the monthly 2,4 running test with full kit under 12 minutes. Daily physical training and sporting activities ensured a fit, focused, and healthy team ready to go at any time. Another interesting factor that led uh, to our success was our faith. By far, the majority of our leader group and troops were well, were self-confessed Christians. We fully trusted in God to protect and guide us. Each battalion had its own chaplain responsible for the spiritual well-being of leader group and the troops. We never doubted that God was with us and would give the enemy in our hands. We prayed before every, every battle. We were fighting for the right cause against uh, uh, the opponent. This was a decisive factor. The next thing was the command concepts. The Defense Force took from the best exponents of mobile warfare, the German Wehrmacht and the Israeli Army, and learned from them how to beat the opponent. The concepts like command initiative, also known as Aufstrachstaktik, high tempo chain battles or Beweglichkeit, uh, envelopment and deep operations. Germans call it Kesselschlachten, and focus of main effort, Schwerpunkt tactics, mobility, etc., were forged into practical combat techniques. Officers were taught to engage quickly through the so called UDA or observation orientation decision action cycle, enabling them to surprise the enemy commanders by our speed of decision making and action. The management principles of planning, coordinating, leadership, supervision, and communication was included in military command and control. If I can just stand still at, at some of these. Planning, the, the South African Defense Force uh, uh, Officers Corps were excellent planners. Courses on all levels taught detailed and thorough long planning cycles followed by orders and rehearsals. This was also true for in-battle appreciations and radio orders. During these planning cycle, uh, intelligence officers would meticulously 
meticulously predict enemy actions on which operational planners would work, at, work out own forces uh, options and our courses of action. All possibilities were war games, and the best course of action would then be drafted into, into orders. Furthermore, everybody knew that no plan survives first contact, and a plan is only a basis for change. This meant that officers had to learn to think on their feet and were trained to give fire direction orders, quick radio orders, and standard commands for fire and movement. The South Africans were literally capable of, after surprisingly running into an enemy brigade, to pull off a fire belt action of uncontrolled fire, win the firefight through the following phases of controlled fire, to maneuver under fire, and then to attack throughout effectively directed fire, direct, indirect, and air, air delivered fire. Commanders um, used to move right in front in the center. This made it possible to analyze the situation first-handed and correctly, and to fight to the front, to the sides, and backwards when needed. On lower levels, the groent or ground attack appreciation was used. It stands for given picture, routes, observation, undercover, non-negotiable or obstacles, distance, and time. Radio orders and radio warning orders and orders would then follow. On combat team level, this would take between 10 to 15 minutes from the first contact to each hour. And uh, on combat group, between uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, was the norm. In most cases, it took, it took shorter than... That's the planning part. The coordination part, uh, one can state that coordination and indirect fire elements on the battlefield. Fire support coordination centers were organized on combat group and brigade levels to plan and execute these with minimum risk to own forces without stopping momentum. Simultaneous actions were at the order of the day. It was also the result of clear deferration of tasks on all levels. Uh, Non-commissioned officers were put in command of supply echelons and non-commissioned officers would operate, uh, ensuring that all tasks were executed with diligence and discipline. And I think we had some of the best non-commissioned officers available. The third uh, element is obviously leadership. In the Defense Force, this amounted to lead by example. All officers and NCOs were taught this axiom. It was true during shooting and fitness exercises, during route marches, and especially in battles. Section leaders were right in line in the line of fire. Platoon commanders were behind the first section. Combat team commanders were right behind the first fi fighting element. They were positioned to directly sense the environment where they could influence the battle with their own presence. During the battle against the brigades east of Quito Carnaval, my rifle command vehicle called Zero, call sign Zero, moved directly behind the first three of my 22 elephant tanks. The battle scars are being hit by several small arms, direct Stalin auto, uh, organ shots, and other weapons were proof of, of this after the battle. It gave the troops a lot of confidence and was definitely one of the reasons why so much success uh, was gained. Commanders would personally sense the situation and make decisions because they could see what was going on on the ground. It was the, it was the situation, uh, if the situation was not for, uh, favorable, the force would safely be withdrawn. The low South African numbers killed in action are often referred to. This was a direct result of this principle. We were making sure that the enemy was dying for his country while bringing our own troops back to safety. Looking at the principle of control, one of the unique features of the Defense Force was their capability to execute what was planned. This was a result of direct command and control on the ground. Small incidents were punished before they became big uh, or large mishaps. The, fo the focused execution of drills and tasks 
formal reporting back and regulations of, of discipline assisted us with this. It was seldom necessary to have formal court cases during operations because leaders on all levels were right in front to make decisions and to lead by example. Very high standards were maintained throughout, either during basic or advanced training. At base or in the field, snackness and untidiness was immediately rectified. The whole system was focused on performance and retaining high standards. Talking a little bit on communication, the bush war happened before cell phones, emails, web pages, and mass media uh, got involved as during later wars. Communication was direct and on a must know basis. Direct command was the name of the game. Everybody knew who their direct commander was and knew the implications of the different command affiliations. On each level, warning orders were issued, then orders, then training and rehearsal, and mistakes could be addressed immediately. Commanders spoke to their troops on every occasion, during parades, in order groups, at field church services, and informally. This created a lot of trust. Radios were used during combat, Standard commands and battle talk a direction and brought calmness onto, onto the battlefield. The other aspect, obviously, is esprit de corps. A lot went into caring or creating a healthy unit spirit. It began with the proudness and the neatness in the uniform and the unit symbols. Image was very important, especially in the eye of the public. We would have weekly parades with inter-unit sport days and many other activities. Nobody could organize as good as the military. I'm convinced that the soldier fights primarily for his budgies and his own regiment. The South African national anthem was often sung, the national flag and unit symbols paraded. It created a feeling of pride. We were focused on winning the hearts and minds of the people. Superiors, equals, and minors were respected, and no slackness or bad discipline was tolerated. There existed a code of honor amongst comrades in arms. Professionalism was strived at. The leader group led by example. This was experienced during fast bait exercises, 2,4, fitness runs, shooting, field exercises, etc. The point of departure was that if you want to fight, Together, you must train together. Officers, non-commissioned officers, and troops were proud to be part of the defense. Right, that I want to address why we, why we won was the lessons learned. The defense force grew over the years. After the 1975 campaign into Angola, it was clear that our weaponry and training were not up to scratch. They, they already, the vision for the future was born. In 1982, after Operation Protea, we at 61 Mechanized Battalion Group started developing integrated techniques and joint battle drills with standard commands. It was realized that the war would escalate. In 1985, 86, when I was responsible for the training of uh, permanent force officers and citizen force officers at the Army Battle School, uh, we moved away from the, 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 the traditional tubes, the tactical exercises with our troops, starting with practical exercises, skeleton forces, ending with full-blown brigade exercises involving, involving all the national service intakes, the uh, swept slug exercises. This included training against each other, two-sided exercises, having real and thinking enemy as well as brigade-sized live ammunition attacks with full-fire coordination. The first attempt at two-sided training was done with gigantic maps that uh, we painted on the kitchen floors at the concentration areas at Luatla, and exercises with skeleton forces parked outside, where the two-sided uh, two exercises using some fire equipment and the tactical withdrawal of the opponent. And as soon as the area was cleared, then the live fire would go in uh, and, and, and was practiced. It was 
it was during these exercises under very realistic circumstances that the later very successful brigade commanders such as Colonel Paul Fouché and Pat McLaughlin from Hooper and Packer got their chances to, to, to actually uh, train practically. We realized that we would be fighting the Angolan bush and against a numerical superior, su superior enemy. Our techniques were ref uh, refined to maneuver and fighting at night. This was, be this was before we, we even had the GPS devices. The action, ac uh, our axiom was do what you can with what is available in a boor marker plan. Uh, and this is exactly what, what we did. So um, a few closing thoughts. The previous uh, South African Defense Force were far superior to the enemy. They, they feared nobody and had a firm belief that with God on our side, we could scale any wall. Training was extremely robust and harsh. You can talk to any troop today that participated in it. No wonder <laughs> we were actually looking forward to go into a fight. Uh, the enemy could thank their stars that we didn't have Roy Cut and Roy Falk and GPS technology. That just came too late for the border war. Thank you, Kurs. Thank you for this. Uh, I must tell you, Jan, I have quite a few questions. But I'll start with one, since you're an armor expert. I met an Israeli general. He wasn't one of the senior generals, but he was a general. And we started talking. Mm. And I explained, as far as I understand, the 6 one may concept of moving around in armor, self-contained almost. I believe at one stage you took a, a cooker shop or something with you in the last sample. Something like that. I still want to talk to that fellow. I understand he begged permission from from the general Roland to um, to go with. I'm sure you know about it. But I tried mm -hmm. to explain to this fellow that you were actually using armor behind enemy lines without real logistics, like in the sense of the American way of doing things, with no oh, real okay. air cover as well. And yet you were successful. You were never cut off. You were never broken up. You were never bombed to hell. You just did it. How on earth? Uh, this, I could see this, this fellow, this general, was not too polite to tell me I'm a liar, but he wanted to know how you did it. And I couldn't answer him. I just said, sir, I did it. I, I don't know how. Would you say what you just explained to us played a role in that type of daring? Now, I think that the first thing was that the fact that we wanted to penetrate deep and, and keep mobile. We never wanted to be in fixed battles and couldn't move out of that. So, so the, 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 the idea was that your, your logistics were also mobile. In other words, we, we, we uh, prepared our water tankers, uh, uh, square full mine resistant, bush capable off-road off uh, vehicles, uh, water tankers, um, uh, 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 ammunition, logistical vehicles. Uh, our uh, tiffies were mobile, so you you could move without a logistical line behind you, and 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 that was all made mobile. So although you might have been cut off, it doesn't matter because you could move the whole force. You would even see later on our G G five guns that proved to be static were changed to G6 guns, so that even the guns could be mobile. Uh, and every, everything was done that way. And, and that ensured that uh, you could keep your, your front force, your, 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 your fighting force uh, mobile. And we didn't want to be fixed at any point. The whole idea was not to take anybody uh, to take ground. That is why you would see uh, once we, we took an objective, and, and, and then we cleared out. Uh, UNITA might have stayed there and, and hold the ground, but even they were not good at holding ground. They were also a type of uh, guerrillas moving around. And I, I think that was the strong point. And we could even, of course, break up the fighting force 
into combat elements, that would be an, an armor and a mechanized infantry element, or combat team that would just be on, on uh, a company or a squadron level, and then combat groups that would be typically on battalion uh, level. And that, that, that was the way we, 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 we planned it, practiced it, and executed. I read somewhere that General Rommel, Field Marshal, as he later became, once mentioned that the desert warfare in North Africa was almost like a sea warfare, like sea battles. But you didn't need to stay at the place, you could move on. It seems that you people in armor took that idea, that principle, and applied it into Angola. That's exactly why I said we, we learned from previous wars. You don't want to learn in your own war. It, uh, Bismarck, the big general, uh, said, uh, only fools say they learn by experience. I learn by the experience of others. And it is exactly this, that you don't want to be pinned down. Once you get pinned down, then, uh, then you are really in a serious problem because uh, your morale goes down. You get hit with everything available from the air or artillery or whatever. And uh, you, you lose communication and contact with each others. And we decided that's not our type of warfare. So we definitely learned uh, from, from previous wars. You know, you mentioned the weapon systems which got developed, but never used because the war came to an end, the way Falk, the way Cot. Mm. I'm thinking by myself, sir, what would have happened if you, the young commanders, because this was incredible. Most of the battalion commanders were what, in their 50s? when they became battalion mm -hmm. commanders. What was the rule yeah. of the fridge when he, he took over 6-1? 34 or yeah, something. We were all, we were all just in our early 30s, yeah. Yes, what would have happened, say, if you people actually became senior generals? And now you, of course, have learned 20 years of what's happening and whatnot, and you could control this thing. That would have been a massive uh, weapon itself. Yeah, I think what, what you would have found, I mean, uh, it never happened, but what, what you would have found is that we again developed weaponry and techniques, and then obviously officers that could command these even higher mobile forces. You know, if, 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 we, had, if we had things like GPS, you could move much faster because you would at least know in that thick bush at night where your forces were. Over here, we didn't have it. We didn't have the GPS capability. I mean, if we had Roy Falk, uh, we could have penetrated much deeper and <laughs> at least probably have, have, have uh, uh, you know, air superiority because we didn't have air superiority. The enemy had air superiority. That's why we, we had to, to wait for, for, for night to, to operate. It would furthermore uh, obviously mean that we would be able to go much deeper because with higher mobility, you could, you could operate much deeper. And uh, it could have given uh, the enemy much more of a, of a challenge. The other, one other thing that we didn't discuss was, you know, our mobile forces, if, if you study warfare and our structures, we, we would always have an element of three. Three platoons in a company, three companies in a battalion, three battle teams or three battle groups. Now, we, even on the lowest level, uh, in, in company level, you had three platoons, but above that, 6-1 only had two mechanized uh, uh, companies instead of the third one. It immediately prevented you from exploiting success. And we didn't have that. Uh, it, it, it really was a fact that nowhere in that old bush war, we had more than 3,000 troops uh, in, 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 in Angola. And you, you know that the, the, the Cubans alone, I'm not even talking about Fatla, the Cubans apparently had 50,000 of them there. Uh, so yes, it, it would have been very interesting if the new weapons came and that group of 30, 34, uh, 30, 34 year olds could become the generals at say 44. I think we would have been even more formidable. Yeah, the Air Force were, were banking on the Tito. And that Cheetah mm -hmm. fighter aircraft was really good. I mean, it defeated the US yeah. F-15 as well as the F-16 in exercises a few years later. 
And that would have gone, given us back the a superiority, which we did it, which we lacked. Yeah, I, I, very, very important also is to realize, you know, we didn't want to escalate the war. One must be very careful on how you analyze the situation. Uh, you could have, we could have escalated it. And, and, and that was not the idea. Remember, we were operating actually not against FAPLA. We were operating against SWAPU. And this, the, the, the problem was that FAPLA gave protection to SWAPU. That was really the, 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 the problem. That's why we encountered FAPLA here and there. Uh, and, and then, obviously, the Russians brought in their the aircraft. And it became a problem because of the distances. Our, our aircraft were excellent. Uh, the, the challenge was that you had to fly from the Namibian border 300 kilos north, if you're, an, if you're a, a pilot, you'd have maybe two minutes for an air battle, and you had to fly that 300 kilometers back. There was no landing site. You would land in the sand if you had a problem. That is why we developed the capability of in-flight in uh, fuel replenishment, et cetera, et cetera. But if, if, if the mobile forces were more and uh, available, we would have taken out airfields behind the enemy, uh, enemy lines quite easily. But we didn't want to escalate the, 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 the war. Remember, what was happening was that uh, uh, we were, were beating these guys. And obviously, to save face, the Cubans had to bring more and more and more Cubans in, uh, Castro. And uh, we then eventually came to a point where we decided to leave a way out so that they could withdraw because they they were uh, they were getting uh, hit and, and and you will remember that uh, one of the generals or so was was uh, fusillated when he uh, when he came back uh, so it's quite it's quite clear what uh, what happened here no there's no doubt to won this I mean they did execute that fellow I also mm -hmm. know that after uh, you took on a wall. I think it was the American Minister of Foreign Affairs, or the Secretary, as we call it, who actually said that the South Africans defeated these people in no uncertain terms. He went on about it. I've got the quote somewhere. Mm -hmm. Do you think so? I've asked this question to Roland de Vries as well as uh, General McGill Alexander. If that Cuban division, the 50th one, I think it, it was called with its 50,000 troops, if they have come south, as they were planning to do, to overrun basically Wambulant all the way into um, into Vintuk. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to me how history repeats, because that is exactly what they did at uh, North and South Vietnam, of course. Uh, that's how they invaded. That is exactly what I believe the Zipra forces were planning to do in Rhodesia. Mm -hmm. Armored Frost, conventional war coming south. Mm -hmm. Two questions about that, sir. Would we have been able to stop them? And secondly, would we have used nuclear weapons to stop them? That it never happened. I just want to say all of you, yeah, it never mm -hmm. happened. We're just talking mm -hmm. military theory now. Well, just on the on the uh, on the first one, you know, the nice thing is if you if you bring a big force like that and you start moving south, the movie had lots of space. We would have stretched them out, taken out the logistical system, and probably picked up all those tanks and just handed it over to to uh, Unita. So uh, we had our plans ready, and we would outmaneuver them. That was the idea, you know. So I, I uh, we're speculating a little bit, but uh, we we planned for that and planned a proper a battle and with all these long distances and I can tell you they were already stretched on the logistics um, they would have really had a, a, a problem if they crossed the border the question if we if we would use a nuclear weapon I'm not so sure we would have done that I don't think we would have landed in a position where we had to use it remember a nuclear weapon is a is a last resort type of thing. I think we developed it to indicate our capability. You know, if you want to deter people, you must have two things. You must have the capability and the will. 
And uh, at that point, you will remember that uh, P.W. Guetta was still the president in the country. Uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody <laughs> would think that the will wasn't there. And the capability was demonstrated. Uh, but we, I don't think we would have, would have used it. Uh, we would, with our conventional forces, be quite capable to sort out the problem. Even if the enemy were, were much stronger, uh, we we demonstrated that already. Okay. Yeah, we demonstrated that we could that we could manage against their conventional forces quite easily. Yeah, and I also believe there were stories of of calling up three hundred thousand men in the reserves. And I spoke to uh, General Borman, the Special Forces Commander later, who was heavily involved in the border war as a more junior officer, and he. I asked him, sir, would we have been able to supply these people to keep them, you know, with food, ammo? He said, yes, we'll do it. We could have done it. So, so that, that, that answers a lot of questions to me. I have a last one for you, sir. Am I correct in saying when we talk about the SADF, the Defense Force, or South African Army Defense Force, we ought to look at it from the views of a Cold War, that it was an anti-communism force, not so much one who hated black people and you know, had slaves there and all sorts of things. It wasn't like that at all. If I understand it correctly, this was an anti-communism force during the Cold War supporting the West, NATO. Yeah, 100%. You, you got it right. Uh, the only reason why we got involved was that uh, the terrorists were backed by uh, communists and, and we were being penetrated from various mm -hmm. sides, you will remember, uh, in, in Mozambique, in, in uh, uh, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and on the Western side. And, and uh, it was, in the broad sense of thing, it was capitalism against communism. And uh, we, believing in a free economy, free country, free uh, uh, world, supported the West uh, in, in, in their endeavors. And uh, I mean, what, what, what really happened is that the communists overplayed their hand. And you can, you can clearly see that's why the, uh, the wall fell, why communism fell, they couldn't, they couldn't sustain it. I fully believe that they were using uh, Castro and these guys as, as the fodder to come to this far country and lose their lives. Uh, and and uh, we were very, very careful with the lives of our people. The other thing that's critical is that uh, there was never a hate for black people. They were our people or brown people. It, it, was, it was our people. We were staying here. And, and, and uh, if you take it 150 years ago, uh, when the British came here, it was a fight between the same type of thing, a force from outside uh, intervening in, uh, in our affairs here. And it was not a fight between black and white. Um, in, in, in this case, uh, we had excellent black troops in various units. And we established in the, the, the different homelands uh, their own defense forces. We even trained them. The, the idea was to, to form a, a strong constellation. And here was a foreign country coming into our shores and opposing us. And that is, is what everything was about. I, I previously spoke to winning the hearts and minds of the people. Which people? Our people. Our people. Our black people. Our uh, own uh, people. The whole idea was, and that was the issue in, in, in uh, Southwest at the time, when uh, resolution, resolution 435 came and we had to, uh, to hand over the country, we did it. It wasn't the question that we were against what, uh, what the free world wanted. It was much more uh, operating against uh, structures and systems that were not uh, for a free world and that were enslaving people. And, and interesting, you could, you could clearly see why they didn't succeed. That would be my, my answer to that. Thank you, thank you. That is, that's a good answer. I think people should remember this because they, mm. what I see in, in Europe is they, they tend to make it very simple and therefore they're wrong. 
it, it was much more complex than what they think and it will be like that with any country if you if you invade a place and you stay on you become an occupier once you become an occupier people don't like you it's that simple yeah. you have to, to get what you need to do and get out the americans learned this part way now you mm -hmm. stay on you become a target you have to move yeah and e e exactly what you are saying was and that is why we never intended taking any ground in uh, in in uh, angola neither in uh, in uh, namibia the intention was uh, was 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 clear and remember in namibia we had the sanction of the united nations to protect it uh, that's why we did it and that's why we fell in with 435 uh, and and didn't withstand or stand against it. Uh, we just wanted it to be peacefully. And uh, when they became a uh, their own republic, even although uh, it went to the Swapo way, that's that's the the way of the democracy. And and even in in our country, I can tell you that our officers' corps were absolutely professional soldiers. Uh, it doesn't matter when we had an election every four or five years in South Africa. If the politics changed, uh, you serve the government of the day because you protect the state. And that is when uh, eventually in 1994, when uh, the dispensation changed, the day Nelson Mandela was inaugurated, you will see there's two people standing uh, right behind him on the podium. It is the chief of the defense force and the chief of the uh, police. They uphold the state. That was uh, where we were, totally professional uh, outfit, doing a professional job. Yes, your oath is towards the constitution. Yeah. And wherever the state is, doesn't matter. It's yeah. just a political party which happened to be in power at that stage. Yeah, that you don't build, you don't, uh, yeah, you don't build a career on on uh, fighting for the politics. And I can tell you now that uh, because I had the privilege of training some of the senior cadres of the uh, South African scenario with the ANC, uh, they actually had a political agenda. They told it to me. They can't understand why I say that uh, we, we, we uphold the state. They fought for a political ideal. And and uh, and I had to reprogram them to say, guys, in the in a professional South African National Defence Force, your position is to uphold the state. Do you think it's possible that there will be like a coup d'état from a new army in South Africa now? Yes, South Africa right now. No. No. It will not happen. The uh, uh, the officers and the defense force, after all these years, realize we cannot go the way of uh, of uh, uh, Rhodesia, uh, Zimbabwe. There, the officers are sitting with a problem. They support the party, so they've got to uphold the party. Otherwise, their whole careers are down the pipes. It's not the case in South Africa. They are excellent uh, black soldiers uh, and officers and NCOs. Uh, in the South African National Defence Force. I believe there will be no coup. I'm often asked, uh, and this is a little bit of a topic, but I'm often asked why the average South African should be proud of a South African National Defence Force. For myself, I support them all heartedly. I don't think they're as bad as people make them out to be. I think they're, they're, it's the same blood, you know, it's the same DNA. In fact, they have better weapons than what we had much better, even if it's now, you know, maintenance issue, money issues, things like that. But as I often say on this program, I do not fear the South African army at all. When I see the soldiers around, especially in Bloemfontein, where I come from, normally the parabats, as arrogant as always, will have to forgive them. It's the way they are. But you know, sir, they do look like soldiers. Even the Ponser yeah. people where you come from, they look like soldiers, they parade, they look fit, they're proud. I don't feel them at all. But if I look at the SAP, where I come from, the police service, even though my Ford police force in my days, I really am scared of these people. They fat, they overweight, they corrupt. They're just dreadful. They were ashamed towards to the country. Not all of them, of course not, but that's the general feeling. 
So what's your opinion, sir, of the SAMDF? Will they fight if attacked? The SA National Defense Force will definitely fight if we are attacked. Number two is they've proven themselves in uh, Bangui. Those paratroopers, excellent. As good as you want it. A small force fighting like lions uh, and coming out victorious. Did very, very well. No, 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 no. There's no, no problem with your young people. They, uh, they want to be there. Uh, and, and, and what is very important is that we rejuven rejuvenate our defense force. We must have an exit strategy. There comes a point when you are 30, 40 years old, where you don't want to run in the sun like a young man. Uh, you've got to bring in young guys. That is important to keep, to keep the, 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 the influx uh, and the, the reason for being there uh, clear cut. So I'm uh, convinced that we need a proper exit strategy. You cannot sit in a defense force when you're 50, 60, 70 years old and want to be a, a soldier anymore. Uh, there's other things in life that you need to endeavor. But uh, our, our junior guys, they are well taught. You can go to the Army Battle School. You can go to the Brug, see the training. Uh, they, will, they will definitely fight. Be careful. The, state, the states uh, will turn slowly, but it turns. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pity what happened to our police force. You know, we had a very, very effective and, and quite brutal uh, police force. And uh, I, would, I would really love to see that, that uh, young blood comes in and that they take the, the old path again. You know, they must be, they must be loved by the, 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 the people, feared by the criminals. And I'm not so sure that is, that is the case. But even in the defense force, that must be the action. Uh, the South African National Defense Force should be loved by the South African people and feared by whatever ever enemy wants to take us on. And we must demonstrate that capability. And again, it, it hinges on two things, your ability and the will uh, to do it. Yeah, I think we've got a lot to be proud about. I mean, just recently, yeah. as you say, that battle of the Parabats and the Special Forces. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Africa, we, we do have a fantastic reputation. I mean, mm -hmm. I've traveled a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa, and you look at the soldiers there, they look like criminals with AK-47s, to be honest with you. I'm quite scared of them. But the mm -hmm. South Africans not. Very highly disciplined. I think in, in one of my books, it was a uh, code name Alphabet 32. I actually looked at the disciplinary problems while on these African missions. And it came out that the South African army had a much better disciplinary record than the French army in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Up to the time when the book was written, there were only three soldiers who got into trouble because they were either, you know, with young women or perhaps with a boy or something. Something happened there. Two of them were all arrested and one of them were actually taken back to the country to be court-martialed in that country. I don't know what happened further to him, but knowing the military police and the detention barracks, I'm quite sure he regretted that decision very much. We also, so we know that, as I mentioned it just now, our Air Force uh, made up you know, the American F-15 Strike Eagles as well as the Belgian F-16Bs and defeated them. These are facts. And then came, of course, in 2008, the Navy guys with uh, Operation Amazolo or something. These submarines actually went out. This submarine went out and he sank this entire squadron of NATO vessels trying to protect some vessels. He sank that one too and all of them, all the warships. He wiped them out. That happened. So I really think we should judge this and um, just give the guys a chance. That, that's just my opinion. Just give him a chance. At least you're not scared of it. Yeah, you can see the performance of our reconnaissance commando elements now in Mozambique also doing exceptionally well. No, no, no. Uh, the, the, the biggest challenge is if you, if you don't have a war to keep your, your people mm -hmm. motivated. But uh, I think, uh, you know, we need to stabilize Africa. We need to get the turnaround movement. 
we, we cannot sit with a, a country that is desperate above us and in our own country where people need uh, jobs. We need to create jobs. We need to be positive. People are looking for leadership. And that is why I'm convinced that we as uh, uh, veterans today have the skills and knowledge and we should get involved wherever you are. As a mentor, even in school level, in town level, we we can make a large difference. We are going nowhere. This is our this is our country, and uh, we dearly love it. We are we are really patriots. We don't do it for our pockets. We do it in our country. We've we've done it forever, and uh, we will do it. And 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 uh, that spirit and inclination must be put forward to all our people.